Welcome to this video on cerebrovascular accident, also known as stroke. In this video, we're going to firstly define what stroke is, then we're going to look at the different types of stroke and the risk factors associated with those types of stroke. Then we're going to move on to how it is diagnosed, how a stroke is diagnosed, and finally, some brief management. So let's start off with a definition of what stroke actually is. So the WHO says that a stroke is a clinical syndrome consistent of a rapidly developing clinical signs that can be focal and or global in nature, lasting greater than 24 hours. So let's break this down, um, this definition down to make more sense of it. The first thing I want you to highlight is greater than 24 hours. So basically, if you had um, a whole lot of signs and symptoms that manifested neurologically, but they disappeared less than 24 hours, then it wouldn't be a stroke. It would actually be probably something that we call a TIA or a transient ischemic accident. So the, the greater than 24 hours is important. The next thing is it's rapidly developing. Now, sometimes stroke is known as a brain attack, similar to what we see with a heart attack, where we get death of um, heart tissue through a lack of blood to the heart. The, the stroke is the same. So it's a brain attack, which means part of the brain, because it's lasted than 24 hours, part of the brain has now died. Okay, and this means that you are going to see rapidly changing signs and symptoms. And this is part of the reason because it's such a profound injury. Now, what could this injury be? Well, they could be focal or global in nature. What that means is if it's global, greater parts of the brain are affected, meaning you see more profound changes, like a loss of consciousness or changes in cognition. Whereas focal changes, it usually means that one part of the brain affected. For instance, you might have a stroke or an infarct or death of tissue in, let's say, the primary motor cortex in this part of the brain, which means, say, um, the motor neurons that are affecting, and this is the left side of the brain, so that means the right side of the body is going to be affected. So part of the, part of the brain that's um, usually affected in the way that the muscles move in the face and the arms are going to be affected, the way we talk, speech is going to be affected. And this comes from, or this leads to the acronym known as FAST, which you may have seen before. So this would be a classic um, manifestations that you see with stroke. So F, face, and we see that because the neurons that it supplied the face has been lost, so you get drooping, that's the face. A, arm, upper arm. Again, left side, right arm will be affected. S, speech, slurred, slurred speech. So this could be aphasia, say, from Broca's area. And then T refers to time, and time is the essence because we have to get on top of it quickly, otherwise it's gonna rapidly develop and deteriorate. And then finally, we have something known as clinical syndrome. So what's a clinical syndrome? Well, it's a cluster or a constellation of signs and symptoms or changes in the body that come about from an underlying cause. So what's the underlying cause of a stroke? Well, there's two. It's either an ischemic cause or a hemorrhagic. And I'm going to put that on the board now. So there's two underlying causes of stroke, one being ischemic, one being hemorrhagic. Ischemic refers to a blockage in a blood vessel that's going to the brain, and hemorrhagic means there's a burst in, in blood vessel in the brain. In terms of the amount, 80 to 85% of all stroke is ischemic based, whereas 20 to 15% is hemorrhagic based. Starting with ischemic, what are the different subcategories of ischemic? Well, you could have what we call thrombotic, which means clot-based. You could have embolic, which means a moving clot, and then you may have systemic. But these are the two most common. So ischemic is sometimes used or referred to as a thromboembolic cause. So what does this mean? Well, starting with the thrombus, there's either two kind of subcategories of this again, and these can be large blood vessel or small blood vessel. The most common large blood vessel is the carotid vessel, which is coming from the heart, common carotid, so off the aortic arch, common carotid, up into the internal carotid, and then we branch into three. So a larger vessel, if you were to have um, atherosclerosis or a plaque formed in that, that means less blood's going to the brain that can be, lead to an ischemic stroke. So large blood vessel plaques, which form in the 
uh, carotid vessels, that could be an underlying cause, or a smaller blood vessel. Sometimes these are known as lacuna strokes, where we have less than 1.5 centimeters of an infarct area, and they're usually the smaller blood vessels. But again, the same thing kind of manifests that being there's plaques growing on the blood vessel. Now compare that to embolic, this means that a clot has broken off and moved up. Now the most common reasons for this, it could be the, the plaque is in the carotid and a disruption has occurred and a little bit of plaque has broken off and then moved up into the brain. But some of the, the other most common causes is coming from the heart. So there could be cardio driven embolics. Now one of the most common, this is the heart, so we've got the left atria, left ventricle, right atria, right ventricle. So what may happen is you may have atrial fibrillation, which means the atrias aren't really contracting well, they're more fibrillating, which means blood clots can start to form in that um, sluggish blood that's in the atria, which means that that clot can then kind of move on down into the left ventricle, then come out and go up to the carotid, which means it's gonna go and get stuck somewhere. That's one cause. So atrial fibrillation is quite common as a cause of ischemic or embolic ischemic stroke. Another would be if you had the valves here, so like the, like the mitral valve, and you had growths that came off the valve and those broke off, then again would come up through the aorta, up through the chromatin, and then we get stuck. Now, interestingly, another cause could be a blood clot in your legs, a DVT. Now, you might ask, well, that should really go to the lungs. But in one third of, pe one third of people, so 30% 30 30 of the population, we actually have what we call a patent foramen ovale. Now, that would be the foramen ovale, which is closed off the septum between the atria. Remember the ovale was open when we were in utero, but it closes off. But in 30% of people, it's still partly open, which means that clot that's coming up from your leg can actually transport across into there, down to there and up into the brain. Now, lastly, we go to systemic causes. This is where something's happening in the system to stop blood going to the brain. So some common causes here would be if you had a cardiac arrest, you know, after say a heart attack, um, could be if you're severely dehydrated and you've got hypotension or shock, this would lead to a decrease in blood flow everywhere, but particularly going to the brain. Now the, chain, the differences there would be, if you had this cause, it would be more global because the whole brain is affected. If it's embolic, even though it's localized, it's gonna be very rapid. And if it's thrombotic, let's say through a plaque, it might be a bit slower in the way it manifests. But how would it manifest? Well, it depends on the blood vessel. So there are three main blood vessels in the brain. There's the anterior cerebral artery, there's the middle cerebral artery, and then there's a the posterior cerebral artery. Now, in terms of at least embolic, which would be probably the most common, but the most likely location where that embolus will go is in the middle or the MCA. So about 90% of clots will go into the MCA. Why is that? It's basically the, the positioning of the MCA. It's almost directly over the top of the internal carotid and it's a bigger vessel. So the clot's more likely to go into there rather than turn 90 degrees in the other directions. So let's say it's an anterior cerebral artery. The area that that supplies of the brain would be kind of this area. So that would be an anterior cerebral artery blood flow region. The, the posterior cerebral artery, this one here, would kind of supply this part of the brain. And that means the rest is the middle cerebral artery, which is this part here. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, this is gonna be the clinical signs that we see. So if it was an MCA blockage, because you're going to be blocking, let's say, the parts of the primary motor cortex, particularly the lower part of the brain and the lower primary motor cortex, that's going to supply the head and neck and arm. So you're going to see changes in weakness in the arm and the face. Opposite side, so this is left side, is going to affect the right. It's also going to affect the sensory as well. So you're going to have sensory changes. Again, face, arm, but not legs. 
But it's also going to affect the language center. Broca's area is here, Wernicke's area is here. So it can lead to aphasia with MCA infarcts. So you might have problems with language, understanding language, that's Wernicke's, or Broca's being you can't execute like talking. Okay, so that common MCA changes. What about ACA, anterior coronary artery, sorry, anterior cerebral artery? That's in blue. That's going to also affect the primary motor cortex, but it's going to affect the primary motor cortex higher up. That's leg. So if you were to have changes, left side of the brain, other side therefore, so this is left, you're going to have right weakness in the leg, as well as the sensory area. So you might have sensory changes in the leg. But also this is going to affect the executive center of the brain. So you could have personality changes, inability to plan, confusion. Okay, and then finally, we're left with the posterior cerebral artery, and this is the, the area here. So that's obviously going to affect the occipital lobe, so that's going to affect vision, but it's also going to go deep into the brain and affect the thalamus and the internal capsule, which are important areas for sensory relay, but also the way that motor axons come down. So you might have whole body changes uh, on one side. So if there's, again, left side of the brain, whole right side sensory loss or motor change or vision loss is more consistent with the PCA. So that's, that's essentially the ischemic effects. Now, in terms of hemorrhagic, which 15% of strokes are fitting in this category, hemorrhagic stroke can be broken into probably two further cat categories. There's subarachnoid hemorrhage and there's intercerebral hemorrhage. So subarachnoid hemorrhage means that the blood vessel is sitting or the blood will go into the subarachnoid space. The most common type of subarachnoid hemorrhage is going to be aneurysms within the circle of Willis, whereas intracerebral hemorrhage is in reference to smaller blood vessels that supply the, blood, the brain. Now, the difference with a hemorrhagic stroke to ischemic is because ischemic refers to more areas of blood vessels that affects regions of the brain. Hemorrhagic is a bit harder to pinpoint because if you have a ruptured blood vessel, it starts to spill out and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So not only is the part of the brain affected that's not getting blood, but that as that blood clot gets bigger and bigger, it's going to start pushing on structures, causing more bleeding, causing more injury, but also leading to a space problem because the blood clot's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which can lead to an increase into cranial pressure. Now, because you're bleeding probably slowly, the changes in a hemorrhagic stroke is going to be a lot slower than ischemic. So, a hemorrhagic stroke could manifest over 5 to 30 minutes. So, that, that might start to change and worsen and worsen and worsen over that time. Whereas an ischemic, particularly embolic, could be straight like a light switch, just on and you see that the changes immediately. Well, starting with the ischemic risk factors, and let's break them into each of these three categories. Well, the risk factors associated with the thrombus, which usually has a basis of atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis can happen in any blood vessel. So the same risk factors apply here. So common risk factors that would lead to atherosclerosis would be increasing age. As we get older, more likely for atherosclerosis to worsen and manifest more greatly. Um, Increase lipid, blood lipid, so hyperlipidemia, smoking, hypertension, diabetes mellitus. All these things increase the chance and the likelihood of atherosclerosis. And this is plaque formation occurring. So all of these are consistent with atherosclerosis everywhere in the body, but particularly in this case, the thrombotic causes of ischemic stroke. What about embolic? This is creating clots. Well, we said already said atrial fibrillation is a big one, but also valve defects, so growths with on, on valves and other clotting disorders. So anything that can increase clotting. And then finally, anything that can throw off an emboli. This could come from a fat origin through a, a fracture. This could come from air. This can, can come from cancer, or it can come from a thrombus that we saw earlier, and like we saw that with a DVT. Finally, systemic causes. I said earlier, this could be from cardiac arrest, like post-MI, 
It could be from decreased blood pressure, so hypotension, and that could come from cases like shock, dehydration, etc. Finally, moving to hemorrhagic risk factors, the greatest one by far is hypertension. So hypertension by far is the biggest risk for hemorrhagic stroke, and that's because the high pressure within the blood vessels can cause structural changes within the brain, within the blood vessel itself can lead to weakening and then the rupture can occur. Um, patients taking certain anticoagulants, so anticoagulants, And these would be warfarin, heparin, certain drugs like alcohol and amphetamines. And one final notable risk factor is what we call atriovenous malformations, which are basically the way that the blood vessels were formed within the brain. And this is probably a congenital abnormality. So let's finish up on how we can diagnose stroke and how we can manage stroke. So here I've got a flow diagram that breaks up ischemic versus hemorrhagic. How do we get the diagnosis? How do we know the difference between ischemic and hemorrhagic and how is it managed differently? So if we were to suspect stroke, we first have to make sure that the other differentials are ruled out. Common differentials would be migraine, tumors, seizures, hypoglycemia. But if we suspect that it is a stroke, the first test that needs to be done to refine whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic is going to be a non-contrast CT. Okay, head CT. And this basically will show, if you have a bleed in the brain, it will show up straight away that it's a hemorrhagic origin. But if you don't see changes, then you can assume that it's ischemic. So remember, 85% of strokes are ischemic in origin. So if we've done our head CT scan and we believe it's ischemic, the next step, if we believe we're within the three hours from the onset, the next step would be the use of thrombolysis. So these are certain agents, certain medic medications that will go up and break the clot up into smaller pieces. Now, if we believe it's after three hours, then the use of something like antiplatelets like aspirin would be then indicated. Next step would be to establish the cause. What's the cause behind the ischemia? Well, in terms of the 85, 17% of is coming from an AF, so atrial fibrillation. So the treatment there or the indication there would be the use of warfarin. 4% is coming from carotid plaque. So this is basically a plaque in the carotid vessel. So therefore, a vascular review will probably be useful to see what can be done to mitigate any further um, problems from that particular origin. And then finally, 64%, so this is a, a vast majority of strokes coming from other causes. These could be from coagulopathies, so the blood is clotting too quickly, or certain systemic causes or other heart-related effects. Moving across to the hemorrhagic, the first step would be to establish a blood pressure, systolic about 130 to 140 millimeters of mercury. And then, like we saw over here, we establish the cause. In terms of 15% of all strokes being hemorrhagic, 4% being from aneurysms. So that would again require neurosurgical review to see what can be done with that aneurysm to stop it bleeding. Hypertensive causes being 7%. Again, that would be managed through um, blood pressure control and other means. And then finally, other causes, common example being the patient is on certain anticoagulants like warfarin or heparin, so that would need to be reduced and 4% being from this cause. So hopefully now what we've seen, hopefully you've got the definition of what a stroke is. You know the two different types, ischemic, hemorrhagic, you know the risk factors associated with it, you know how to diagnose it, and you know then how to treat later down the track.